and how would you guys, okay, so you start around the same time, by what, 2018 or 17, that's going to be the good to 10 years, it's a decade of your lives. Do, do you see poker continuing to be where you want to work or in, the, in those industries? Or do you, do you kind of see it as, oh, well, maybe a few more years? Or but For me, the weird thing is that, because I, I really, really want to try and, and play more and actually, you know, like try this this pro life, especially because I, before I started working for Italian poker, I, I, was le- I was leading this backpack life. So for three years I was living out of the mm-hmm. backpack, and and I was happy, yeah. and that's like the the thing. Now that I bought all the furniture, and all of a sudden I'm in this whole, I'm earning money, and it's good money, and I have a nice apartment, and I have all the furniture. And I was like, but I don't want all that. That's like yeah. the thing at the moment. It's like I want to have this backpack life back. So mm-hmm. when when really this all the moment was so weird when he came in with his background. I said, this is exactly. The thing, yeah. but I'm in my mid 30s. We I'm, also would want to be a lady like that, it wouldn't just be. <laughs> <laughs> but then the thing was, because the, 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 the thought came earlier about this, and then and I thought, I can't do this in my mid 30s and just start playing poker. But then we talked, and then I was like, hang on, so I could still. But then again, so like I'm being thrown around here, like terribly, because I was talking to one of the young online wizards, um, and I was talking to him about that, and he said, Okay, well, yeah, like seven, eight years ago, you made money online to pay for your rent, but that's like a lifetime in poker. Mm. Like, if you want to go back onto poker stars now, mm. you won't be able to. You get eaten alive yeah. if you don't have all the the, the skills sharp. Well, I think I think what's interesting about the two of your personalities, which is similar, is that you're very uh, compulsive, if you like. That you know, Dara puts in huge hours, and much, I'm lazy in comparison, but you would put in serious amount of time. Long online sessions. Um, we probably play similar amounts of numbers of live games these days. But even combining those two um, is um, is a feat in itself. There has been uh, well, you're super known for the last couple of years. But it's more about the volume across all the sites because you do play all the sites. Yeah. Um, and I'd say you probably bar the sit and go grinders have played a bigger number of tournaments than anyone else for the last seven or eight years in Ireland. And you're clearly somebody who's put in these 12 and 14 hour days and is willing to do the hard work. And to be honest, that's what it's really about. It's about you're willing to do the hard work. And are you willing to really like obsess about something um, and uh, and turn it into your passion? And you know, you have done that already in a different side of it. So right. that probably just involves a reapplication of all that energy. Yeah, I think if it's your passion, like it's, it's definitely easier. Like poker consumed me for the first few years I was doing it. And mm. Even when I wasn't playing poker, I was talking about poker, I was <clears throat> yeah. reading about poker, I was writing about, about poker, um, so, or, or, or watching poker. So like when you when you fully immerse yourself in it, that's, that's, that's um, a much better way to get uh, better quicker. But then the, the, the flip side is like, you have a lot of negative experiences of poker, you have down swings. Um, yeah. it's, it's one of the few jobs that you can like do your job perfectly, and at the end of the day, you've got, you've got less money than you had at the start exactly. of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, that's I think that's the most difficult thing for most people that I've seen. It's it's uh, it's the whole how you get money out of poker because people focus on like, the big result oh, you won 47,000, that's brilliant, but they don't realize that that's like one result maybe in a year. And then the rest of the year you're losing, 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 <coughs> and, and you have to be able to deal with that, and you have to be able to, you know, maintain a level head, keep doing all the things that that that, that make you a winning player, even when things are going badly. Yeah. yeah, like we would play maybe fifty to sixty, maybe at a push seventy live tournaments a year, and you know our cash rate's pretty good. We're probably going to cash twelve to fifteen times out of that sixty or seventy, which is you know cashing one in five when they only cash out one in seven, maybe on average is is, is pretty good. But, but the reality is, most of those caches are main caches or something close to main caches. That's the other thing, yeah. So your whole year of 70 tournaments live is going to come down to probably two final tables where you make the better half of the final table, like two top five finishes, is maybe going to dictate whether it was a good year or a losing year. Then you're going to have years where you don't even get that one result. So yeah. it's, and like, the other thing is cash rates have come down. Like I used to keep records from the start because I wanted to figure out whether I was a winning player or not, and I cashed about thirty-five percent of live tournaments uh, when, I, yeah. when I started. And then I remember talking to John Eames a few years ago in Berlin, and I said that that was my cash rate. He said, "Yeah, I actually think that good players will cash 35 percent," yeah. which was true at the time. Nobody does that anymore. No, it's just not possible. Um, so like, you, uh, you, even live has gotten harder. Let's say so that uh, that, that makes it tougher. Yeah, it does make it tougher, and I think um, you know, for for you getting into it now, it 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 it's almost a new kind of intimidation. It was intimidating for you to sit down in the fits yeah. and sort of 
self deal and play with people that you thought were all staring at you because you were the only younger girl there. But now you've got this other issue, which is okay. You've a lot of friends in Bogey. You're well connected. You can you can get them to help you speed up that learning curve. But at the same time, like it's a shark tank. The, the whole yeah. the whole um, world of online poker now is just very tough, unless you're very lucky in a one off situation, yeah, or or very good, or a, <laughs> <laughs> that works too. Yeah. yeah, that would be nice in a lifetime. That was a big, big score. That kind of luck. Yeah, but, it's, uh, but I don't. That's the thing. So I, I'm, I don't want to think that the dream is dead. You know, there's still people coming out. But they're all like, if you look at the German players, like all the young kids, they're all like math students, and they just mm. they just function on a whole different level. Well, that's it. Like you, you look at poker in the old days, where you know it was no playing sites and that kind of like Doyle's time or something, and it was. Texas road gamblers and it was all swashbuckling guys and I'm sure there was a little bit of social poker being played in America. It was very macho and that bled into the first sort of paradigm I was aware of in poker which was late night poker on Channel 4 on TV, yeah. first poker show that showed the cards under the table, all the characters was almost set up like it was a like WWE wrestling or something that was all personalities mouthing at each other um, and when you look back at those tapes now the standard was very low. The standard of the actual poker, yeah. Yeah, compared yeah. to now. But at the time, when we didn't know better, you were just like, oh my God, he went all in, he knew that you didn't yeah. have it, and, and you were caught up in the drama of it. Yeah, and he made him do that. Yeah, it was, I, know, I think poker at the time, it was almost so the way that wrestling is, which was, mm. uh, you know, personality against personality, and one personality triumphs. So yeah, yeah. And, and then, but then now you look back and just, well, well, he had aces and he had kings, so of course yeah. they got their 10 big blinds in. Yeah. Yeah, or, yeah, when he goes all in, without the hand, and he should have no fold equity, but the guy doesn't even understand what fold equity is, so he's putting way too many chips on the flop, and then he has to get away because he has nothing, and you're like, none of these hands make sense in the modern world, but they did make sense then, I guess, but, but I guess the point I'm trying to make is that it was all about aggression, like we look back on guys who came and went, and I, I won't name names, but there's plenty of Irish guys, English guys, American guys, who had amazing three or four years in poker, or amazing even five or six years in poker, probably got sponsorship deals and whatever. And maybe they, they you know, I'm sure they were smart guys and I'm sure they figured out something at the time and they, and, they had, and they were clued in. But what really happened was they were really aggressive. They were willing to bluff a lot. And just that was enough. That was enough to become really successful. Yeah. And then it seemed to move away from like, as everyone became, you know, so maybe back in those days it was like jock kind of personalities were the guys who would win because it was all about brute force. Now the best players in the world are all nerds. Yeah. You know, like everyone's kind of a nerd or maths geek. And, and they're the ones destroying everyone. Yeah, and I had this weird moment in Malta when I had like the last night in Malta, I was eating with 12 German poker player guys. I was having dinner and um, I, t I, I talked about that. I said, I would really like to get more into this whole thing, but I, I don't think I'm, I'm smart enough because now you look at everybody's like a math genius. Mm. And it seems to be on a level that I, I don't think I can get to because I'm really bad at math. And then, and then the guys were like, no, no, you don't need math to be a good poker player. And I said, what did you guys study? And all three of them was like, math. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I think it is true that you don't need math. Like I know, like I know a lot of... Uh, Says the other math background, the worse than the other one. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but like, I, like I, the way I always think of it is like, it doesn't really matter why you do something, so long as you do the right thing. And like a lot of the better players that that I, that I know uh, don't actually know the math, but like you ask, well, what would you do in this situation? And they give the correct answer because they pick they picked up through observation or intuition or mm. or I think a lot of players even just learn by watching what successful players do, and they go, well, he did that, and I would have done that. That's interesting, and then they think about it, and then yeah. maybe they start doing that, play, playing hands that way. Mm. Um, so like I don't think it's strictly necessary, but it's certainly a huge advantage. Uh, it gives you like a that. base a base to work with. Yeah. Yeah, like most of my big uh, eureka moments in, in, in poker or where I, where I worked out, where I suddenly figured out the, the math that applies to a particular situation, and then I could go off and work out exactly the strategy that you're supposed to do in that situation. Um, but I think that kind of information is out there now anyway, so you know there are training sites and videos that teach you yeah. all, all the things to do. What would you say big eureka moments in your own game are? Like that, I, we've all had them as well, where you... You suddenly, well, you know, like obviously Nash equilibrium was a big one for you, and that was Daryl was doing the Nash tables 
kind of around the same time as the first people were starting to figure it out and you would work them all out from scratch and then yeah. you know, well, a few months later saw them at the back of the book and were like, oh, Yeah, I, I, think I, I think I had about 18 months before Kill Everyone came out and they were just in the back of the book. And like, that kind of makes the point because I, I made a, like I had a sudden surge in my earning potential on them because I had figured out a perfect push forward um, from first principles. And there was a period where the, uh, there were obviously other players who had done it too, but the information wasn't out there. It wasn't because already. people knew the steel or the real. Yeah, this it wasn't the real things to the kingdom. It wasn't writing sites. Um, none of us were writing strategy articles about it. Yeah, because right. we, we we all thought. Well, I, I guess a lot of us thought well, first we might be the only people who know this stuff. Yeah. But then, like eighteen months later, okay, everyone comes out, and now it's in the back of a book, and people can just look at the chart and go, mm. "Yeah, I'm supposed to go all in here. You know, I'm supposed yeah. to pull this." So all. And even going back further, and and their uh, charts were not as good as Dara's were, or like the Nash charts of you know guys today. But even going further back, Chris Ferguson and Andy Block had that same experience yeah, together. Chris, where um, they've been writing um, these these, these push-fold charts and then they were like, I do that too. And it was like the first time anyone even come up with the idea of having ranges and they and they show them and they like look and they're like, Oh, I have like I, I, I go with one pseudo connector lower than you, but you go with one ace less than me here and you know, just they but they done it in a rough way, which was yeah. you know, showing that that yeah, was. Yeah, I, I, I remember well. one Moshman had one on the back of his uh, some of the book on sit and goes and like for the first couple of years after I moved transition from limit cash, um, I was playing just sit and goes. So, but those charts were still a bit off. Like there was a couple of things which were wrong with them. They they overvalued you know certain types of hands like suited connectors and small pairs in certain situations. They undervalued low suited aces um, and so on. So even having worked out the math and understanding, like I remember the first time I think I ever got shoved. It got caught showing a four suited in early position with a certain stack size, and there was another pro at the table, and he goes, "Is that really a correct shove? How can that be a shove? You've got a terrible ace, and you've mm. got a whole table to go through." But like I knew that the, the math, that mathematically it was correct. Whereas he said, I, "I, to be honest, I prefer to show five four suited because if I'm called, I won't be dominant." It's but just terrible logic. Like. Yeah, but that's the way people yeah. thought back then. They go, yeah, "Well, yeah. well I'm not, I've got I two like cards." Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Kind of, that kind of idea is that all yeah. oh, you do you want to just have. You know, two 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 napkins than yeah. an actual ace. That yeah. Be because uh, well, what happened is like people would shove an ace or like like that, and if you get called, then you're nearly always dominated. So people would remember that, and they would go, "Oh, I was yeah, dominant. Yeah. I'd stop doing that." Mm. Whereas if you actually sit down and work out the maths, like the 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 the, the prof the 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 money you make from let's say shoving ace two for fourteen big blinds on the bottom comes the fourteen times out of fifteen that the guys all fold. But you don't remember those because you just yeah, get the blinds yeah. and you sack your chips and, and you move on to the next hand. You remember the one time you shoved and the guy had his king or his queen and you got knocked out. Mm. Uh, so because of that negative experience, people yeah. go, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. That's obviously bad. Mm. But did you have the, did you have these kind of moments? Like, obviously with coaching, maybe that helped. Yeah, you absolutely. kind of were like, oh, wow. So, so having, that's why it don't work. It's like the whole Nash thing, for example, I've just heard about now from Jamie a couple of weeks back. So it's like, mm. I'm not sure when I should have heard about that before, but I've just completely never heard that term before. And so that's what I mean. I'm just like around poker schools for such a long time, poker education, I've just missed so much. Mm. But my, my big aha moments were more on the field side of things at the live table when when I realized I got more confident that, that those were the were the very first thing and I think it's actually both moments were at the same table that fits like right in the beginning. And one was when I had booked Kings and I flopped a set and, and my heart just went crazy. Like okay. I, I was like that was one of those moments when I realized what poker is, is doing and, and mm. what that means. Because I, I like reading people on that, you know, yeah. that's like my little thing that I, mm. I'm really happy about just staring at people and seeing what they do and how they act. And then suddenly I saw it myself and my heart started racing and my hands started shaking. <laughs> the first time in my life I flopped a set and and, and, I, and I remember that they must see it, they must see this right now. That, so that, that was a moment for me that was really interesting because I saw what it did with my with my organism mm. <laughs> just like having an, an, an event like that and and then later um, when I got more experience and I had this moment when I knew that only if my opponent had a queen he would beat me so he went all in and I was just like okay only if he has a queen he beats me so I was like do you have a queen and it was the very first moment in my life when I actually just like talked to a player I was like do you have a queen and he just looked at the at the board I was like okay he doesn't and then I was just like called and it was such a nice moment when 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 I, I realized that okay I'm, I'm getting more confident. But so those were my little. Yeah. So you would engage people when you're playing live. You would 
you these days you'd be very chatty. Yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 this so following the Daniel, exactly, Daniels yeah. kind of so what I actually wanted modus. to learn to do yeah. is like talking to people, and that's what I'm doing now as well. And because I've 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 been told I'm I'm difficult to read, so that's good. I don't know. Yeah, I play with you. I would agree with that. That's <laughs> cool. Yes. Um, so so that's why I'm I'm quite confident to just start talking to people and then mm. hopefully not giving away too much of myself. But I can see a lot from from other people, so that's more my thing. As soon as it comes to math, my brain shuts down. So I have to focus on mm. on those things I'm good at and just try and drag the math along somehow. Yeah. Well, that's always uh, you know there's always there's two aspects to the game, I guess, or well, there's multiple aspects, but the maths or the logical side of the game are one, and then the I guess it's life is what you're interested in. The, yeah, the psychology of human interaction, behaviorism mm. kind of stuff is good. But I, I would I would strongly kind of give priority to the game theoretical aspects over the yeah. behavioristic ones just because people can fake yeah. the behavior. It also ones. depends. I, th I think it also depends on um, the, the, the types of fields that you're in. Like, I think, well, that's true. I think because everybody is like aware of that you can give away information. I think we're much more savvy about all that stuff and, 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 and tend to give away. Like I found when I played in the in the uh, the main event here, like even though you know not everybody was a pro and, and I'm pretty sure like at least half the table were amateurs, still nobody was really giving away too much information. Yeah. Now in contrast to that when I played the Hamburg Cup last night and now you have like the guys who are really just enthusiasts for the most part mm. and, uh, and, and and not very experienced live. And I was watching them and I could pick up a lot of information mm. on them. It was the first time like the guy who was sitting beside me, um, similar to you said, like your heart started pumping when you flop said, I could see every time he had a big hand because the yeah. his neck just started to pump back. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what he like he either has to get himself under control or like wear a scarf. He should have just wore a scarf because <laughs> the weird thing was he was wearing like a hoodie and or no not a hoodie, he was wearing a cap and sunglasses. Yeah, so he was obviously <laughs> But, but I'm just looking at his neck going, yeah, okay, yeah. you've got to set this camera off yeah. I, had, I had a friend where I saw that, that every time I had a good hand, like he had the vein popping out of his forehead. Oh, for God's sake, yeah. And, and every single time, because he was a friend, I told him, like, listen, you have to. You have to do something with like your forehead. <laughs> do something. Start wearing caps, or yeah. So, no, no, but I understand. And I'm, I'm trying to get into the, the whole um, strategy yeah. part of things, and I'm really. It's not like I've never done it, you know, but it's um, it's, it's hard for me. As soon as math is involved, my brain just shuts down. It's just something. Mm. Well, to be honest, like I think, like for me, the biggest part in the maths has been learning learning to do what what the right thing to do is. It's not like you sit at the table and you you know you crunch. No, you know, no, the but you should be. No, the only time you're doing that is when you're working out if you're priced in. Yeah, then you go. Yeah, oh, and, and it's and fairly simple. I'm a forty percenter. It's, it's relatively simple. And, and those were the few moments like, in life yeah. when I sat there and I thought, I wish I could calculate. But it's so rare that you actually sit there and try and, and figure out if, if, if the call would be correct or not. It's so rare mm. that I was, um, okay, those few times, I mean, I think it's usually big pots, obviously, but um, it's like that's, then I was like, I wish I could calculate this now. And I could go, <laughs> but it was so close that I couldn't, I couldn't do it. So I was like, usually on the wrong end then, obviously. Mm. <laughs>